paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. I just didn't feel right in who I was. I really thought, though, am I in the right body? The first time I realized was when she wanted to go out. I want to wear a skirt and I want to wear a, a frilly top. Yeah. And I want you to call me. Her. Her. I didn't like boobs. I thought that they would be disgusting on me, and I still have that opinion. I didn't want my period. No, no, no. That would just be terrible for me. I would rather have facial hair and chest hair and muscles. I'd just rather not have boobs. <laughs> I definitely think I was born transgender. I think that's how transgenderism works. I don't think it's something that you decide to do or you just stumble upon. It's just who you are. So there's nothing new about trans lives. Trans people are everywhere we always were. And it's perfectly natural to be trans. It's just one of the ways life works on this planet. We're very devoted to a very simple set of ideas. There are two genders and only two genders. And they are so different from each other that we can call them opposite. We talk about the opposite sex. This has very little to do with human reality. There are animals in which females are dramatically different from males. We are not one of those. Take a deep breath. And out. Read normally for me now. The problem is we create this idea of rigid gender stereotypes. And our whole purpose in life is to essentially live those stereotypes. Uh, if it really hurts, let me know, and then I can always stop, okay? Sure. All right. For the vast majority of people, it works. And it does. But for a lot of people, it doesn't. And more people than you think, it really doesn't work. We are assigned gender and gender expectation when we're born. But sometimes the gender assignment doesn't match. The transgender movement is like it's challenging the most basic thing that we've been led to believe as a society, especially in the Western culture, is that you're just male or female. I always got mistaken for a girl, even when I was just like 11 or 12. Strangers would call me she and her, and I would be really embarrassed because I didn't know what my family was going to think. When I transitioned, I was 15, so when I started to hang out by the pier and stuff and I met older trans women is when it kind of clicked for me. It all made sense. I was kind of pushed into seeing the counselor because I guess the staff at my school just didn't understand what was going on with me. I remember her giving me a pamphlet, and it said something about being born in the wrong body. I was like, that really feels like something I can identify with. When I was a child, I identified as female. I was even quite feminine, and I was okay with that. But there was always a fluidity for me when it came to gender. I always felt that I could be a girl or I could be a boy. I could be both. Um, and this wasn't something that I necessarily spoke about. And then I grew older, I moved away to university. And it was during that time that I first came out as a lesbian at 21. I knew that my gender identity was changing. It wasn't the same when I was 25. It wasn't the same as when I was 17. I 
I came out as trans at the age of 30, and that was very shocking to a lot of people. But the place that they were coming from was, well, you know, we never, we, in the news, it's only about, it's about young people. Only, you're supposed to know when you're a child. Uh, every single trans person knows when they're a child, not when they're 30. Wow. Yeah, our cats don't do that. They don't? No, except one of them is... The misconceptions are that there's just one story. This person knew when they were a toddler and has always known and was suffering terribly. It's a very simple story. And of course, it's much more complicated than that. For one thing, many people don't know when they're toddlers. Transgender identity can emerge at any point in the life cycle. And we often feel quite pressured into that simple story I always knew. I came from the part of the world in Asia where gender fluidity has always been part of civilizations for thousands of years. In the Philippines, we used to call it babaylan, which are priests that are two-spirited and it's actually revered. In India, it's called hijra. The Buddhist goddess of compassion, Guan Yin, is a transgender woman. And not just in Asia, this exists in every single old civilization. You know, the Native Americans have it, Peruvian have it, Iran had it. Nature loves diversity. Nature thrives on diversity. Nature dies if it doesn't have diversity. We need to see diversity in gender, and we need to give up on this idea that there's only two genders, even give up on the idea that there's only two sexes. The biggest challenge that transgender people have is most people want to look at somebody, anybody, everybody, and say, male or female. And they feel they need to know that before they know how to do anything with that person. How to talk to them, how close to stand with them, what things you can and can't say, how much eye contact to make. Most people, if they meet somebody and they can't tell whether they're male or female, are, are dumbstruck, they don't know what to do. They, they just get completely stuck. My family were unsure of how to even react to this situation. I always felt like they were putting roadblocks in ways of things that I wanted. My mother would constantly pressure me not to pursue transitioning until I was done high school. But that was something that was way too important to me to put off, so I went ahead with it anyway. Things. What are you looking for, honey? Oh, you have to appear there. Is there another one like that? I never came out to my family. I never told my mother I was gay or anything because I didn't feel like I was gay. I just started dressing as a girl. It was confusing for me. I didn't know anything about transgender. I never educated myself prior to my child being transgender. I did cringe when I first saw her walk out the bedroom dressed as a woman. You know, I was a little taken back by it. And I had all these different emotions going on. I didn't know how to take it. But um, I never told her not to be who she is. I don't know why I felt feminine, why I felt like I was born in the wrong body. I don't have those answers. I just know that this is who I want to be. It's a little difficult to explain to someone what it means to be trans when you yourself quite don't understand it. You just know that this is how you feel comfortable. <laughs> no matter how much you try to convince them that you are a woman and that this is how you're supposed to be, there are just are those people that will never believe you and say, no, you're not a woman. You are a man and you were born a guy and that's that. People hasn't been aware of what does it mean to be transgender and what transgender people are experiencing. When we're born, the birth certificate only allows female and male. When you're challenging those binary, people believe that they have the right to judge you. There was a time when every piece of ID had your race on it. Now people look at the idea as ridiculous because where does one race stop and the next one begin? And that whole idea is now recognized as a social construction. 
And transgender people are increasingly pushing the envelope on that and saying, well, you know, maybe we don't need to have gender on every piece of ID, and maybe we don't need to divide up your access to every kind of resource, right, and privilege in society on the basis of what your genitals look like. What does that have to do with it? Each person's transition is unique. There are some people for whom transition is about changing their name, their haircut, and their clothing, and that's it. They do not want or need access to hormones or surgeries. For other people, a broad range of hormones and surgeries are really essential to a decent, livable life. Once my parents were informed, the next thing was seeking help. I was super nervous because when you grow up thinking there's something wrong with you, trying to guess what doctors have to say about it is pretty scary. The first time I went to see them, I was 16. So I always thought that by the time I was done high school, I would be in a really good place as far as my transition would go. But I got nowhere <laughs> for six years. So the traditional model of trans care would argue that there's a set of criteria that trans people have to meet in order to be identified as having gender identity disorder. The first struggle is just even being recognized as a transgender person. I can't really say what their point in all that was, but I felt as though maybe they were trying to instill doubt in me that I was transgender, maybe that I was just mentally ill. To be quite frank, the amount of knowledge in the medical community approaches zero. There is virtually no teaching about transgender healthcare in medical school. There is really no teaching in residency. And unless a physician like myself takes it upon themselves to go out and educate other physicians, the amount of training that physicians get around transgender care is essentially nothing. I became very depressed. I ended up cutting off ties with all of my friends because why start a new chapter in your life when you're still in a place where you don't want to be? They're moving out of their parents' house, they're learning how to drive, even trivial things like dating. How do you date when you're a transgender teenager who's super insecure? Quest is a transgender healthcare clinic. What we use is a patient-centered, informed consent model of care, which essentially allows the patient to self-identify. And then what we try and do is figure out what they actually want to do about their identity. And for most people, that answer is to transition, but it's not the answer for everyone. For me, the challenges were obviously like going through high school and having to deal with people seeing my transition as I was experiencing it. So as I gradually became more feminine, people had more to talk about. I think express yourself more fully as a human being in a more rounded way. The fact that I'm transgender is nobody's business but my own. And the people who I choose to tell are people that I trust, not random people that I'm just forced to interact with. If I go to apply for a job or apply for school, the way that I look doesn't really raise any red flags, but if I hand identification over that identifies me as male, I don't really want to deal with all the questions that follow. The way we do gender generally in this culture is so messed up. A man has to be constantly demonstrating that he's manly enough. A woman has to be constantly demonstrating that she's feminine enough. But as trans people, we disrupt that whole system just by our very existence. I knew who I was when I was very young. I remember watching a documentary about Rene Richards with my dad. I went to the Google of the 1970s, which was the Encyclopedia Britannica, and looked up transgender, transsexual, and I went, wow, I think that's me. Here I was growing up in Northern Ontario in the 1970s, blue collar, Inco mining town. There was no way I could tell anybody about this. So I chose personally to try and put it into a box. I was born in 1925. 
At that time, there was absolutely no knowledge, no professional knowledge, no medical knowledge, no public knowledge of this condition, which came to be known as transsexualism. I was probably about four or five when I had a dream. I saw a girl. And eventually the girl identified herself as me. I looked in a mirror in the dream and I had long blonde curls. I couldn't explain it. There was no vocabulary or anything like that to explain it. And uh, for a long time, I thought it must be the only person in the world who was affected by this condition. I used to lie awake at night worrying about it. I went to bed and prayed to God I'd wake up in the opposite sex. Most transgender people have this sort of idea that, you know, God at some point will recognize that they made a mistake and will correct things, and it never happens. You want to live your life. So you make a deal with yourself. If I can just do this, I'll be okay. Or if I just get through this, then maybe I'll be okay. If I'm the perfect father or the perfect doctor or the perfect son, then nobody would be able to see who I really was. I honestly believed, I think, when I got married, that I would never, ever do anything about it, that I would go to my grave with it as a secret. While I was in the Navy, I was at Bombay in India, and I went to a bookstore, and I found a rather surprising book there called Man into Woman. This would be about 1944 or five. I bought this book, took it on the ship. I read it very secretively when everybody had turned in, and then I hid it in a suitcase I had with a pile of clothes and <laughs> hid it underneath where it couldn't be found and uh, uh, hung on to it for quite a long time. But after reading that, I knew there was an answer to this. I just remember driving home one day after a night shift at the hospital. A transgender person had come in and had had a, uh, a cardiac arrest and had passed away. And I remember looking at that person and thinking, you know what, I don't want to be buried as a man. As I drove home that day, I thought, you know, I got to do something about this. Just seeing somebody who, you know, was living their truth, to me it just seemed like I was a liar. I was somebody who didn't even have the courage to be myself. Overriding everything was my desire to lead what I defined as a normal life. I had a wife, I had a home, I had children, I had a decent job. I had the satisfaction of knowing that I was a respectable kind of person. The crisis point came at the end of the second marriage. I knew the only answer for survival I was personally concerned was going to be to go through with a gender change. I really honestly believe that if I didn't transition, if I didn't wasn't truthful about who I was, that, you know, I couldn't, no matter how hard it was, I couldn't be truthful to my partner, I couldn't be truthful to my children, my friends, my family, my parents. And so I, I really, really felt that I, I finally had to live my life honestly. And that's a hard decision because it, it's had consequences. It devastated my partner. And justifiably so, it was devastating for her. I wish, you know, that I had told her before we ever got married. I wish I had done that. I wish I had the courage to do it. I didn't. And that's certainly my biggest regret. I 
I transitioned in my early 50s. But there was a very long period between that recognition and summoning up the courage to actually take action. I remember standing there and just weeping because that's me, that's me in the mirror in a way it really had never been in the past. Uh, there was a sense of coming to a place of wholeness uh, that had such a deep impact of so much joy, so much joy and comfort. When I first started taking hormones, the feeling was amazing. You think you're gonna suddenly get huge boobs and curvy hips and smooth, silky skin. It's nothing really like that. Hormones take what you have and they feminize it. So for me, I developed breasts, my hips filled out more, just the basic markers of being a woman. I knew that at some point I would have to decide, am I gonna go on hormones or am I not? And I knew that if I didn't go on hormones, my life would be really, really complicated. I took my transition actually very slow. Right, so I didn't rush into hormones and I started on a very, very low dose. I wanted to have complete control over what was happening to my body. Um, that was really important to me because it felt like, um, like it just a, I knew that this was a, a very huge life change. As I often tell my clients, I can't change your bone structure. I can't change your height. But it's amazing what a little bit of surgery and some really good hormones can do. The ability to pass on a daily basis has completely changed the quality of my life. I can't actually imagine what it would be like if I still wasn't passing. I wasn't sleeping at night, it was all I thought about. Every single interaction that I had with people, my mind was bombarded with, am I gonna be passing, am I gonna pass? How's this person gonna read me? Passing is a term that we use in the trans community to talk about can you blend in with the population? You know, can anybody tell that you used to be male or female? I don't think it should be important, but when I talk to clients and in their day-to-day -day lives, it does matter because it's really hard to live your life every day being challenged about your gender. The problem is that our brains are so attuned to seeing gender in a certain way, you know, that men should look like men and women should look like women. Being passable helps you a lot. It really does, in so many ways. It helps you to get the guy you may want. It helps you to go to school, go to work. It helps you to walk down the street without getting harassed. People accept you when you're passable. I think the gift and the curse for me is men are attracted to me, but when they find out, they're like, uh-oh. It's not easy for a guy to deal with that. You can't just say, okay, just accept me, I'm trans, it's not a big deal. You can't just do that. When I made the decision to move to New York, I told myself I would consciously not fully talk about it. So when they started modeling, you know, I wasn't saying that I'm trans, I'm just, I'm a female model. I always have this nagging voice in the back of my head. There was a constant paranoia and fear. And I would even remember going in photo shoots and thinking, do they know? There's always that question, do they know? Are they, if they find out, do they think that I have fooled them? Or I was like, do they think I'm lying? Transphobia works in some very particular ways. It's a lot focused on being a freak. It's also focused on being fake, that being trans is somehow trying to deceive other people as to who you really are. And the punishment that's everywhere all the time is shame. If you are seen to be breaking the rules around gender, you will be subject every day to dozens of little interactions which tell you there's something wrong, you don't belong, you make me uncomfortable. There's probably been a couple of times that I've actually stopped and turned to the person and said, do you realize what you're asking me when you're asking me if, if I've had the surgery? And then I'll just turn it right back on them and I'll ask them, 
if not if they've had the surgery, but I'll ask them what's what's in your pants. <laughs> I started out on the street. That's the only place the girls had to make money was the street. Every trans girl I know, with the exception of like five or four, are prostitutes. That's what they do for a living. They have no choice, and most jobs won't hire them because they look like trans women, and so people discriminate against girls like that. And then I met a trans woman that was a bit older than me, and she said, oh, you're pretty, do you want to make money? And she showed me how to like post my advertisement on the internet and tour from state to state and make real money. I was 16 and I was just making lots of money, too much money for a 16-year-old. I was really scared of getting hurt. Sometimes I'd be by myself in a hotel room in the middle of nowhere, and it would be late at night, and these men would come to see me, and I'd be by myself. You don't know who's coming into your room. You don't know who they are, what kind of past they have, or if they have a weapon on them. You don't know anything about this person. Who knows what could have happened to me? Here's the deal. Access to jobs, access to housing, access to family, access to partners, all of those are difficult for trans people because of transphobia. Nothing, it's not because we're trans, it's because of transphobia. The stats are very solid. We have double the rates of unemployment. Overwhelmingly, we live in poverty. We are more vulnerable to assault than any other community, and that is doubly or quadruply true for trans women. So it's very clear that is discrimination. There's no other explanation for it. I got in trouble with the law three times. I actually had to go to a, a jail, and I was in a dorm with men, with like, you know, grown men. I was so scared because I had never been to jail before. It just was like an epiphany. It just all clicked to me at that point. I, I just said, I don't want to do this anymore. When there's that discrimination from the outside, it's very hard to hold on to self-esteem. And when we're younger, all of us have less resilience. The risk of suicide for trans youth is extremely high. And with good family support, that risk drops by 93%, which I think just makes it so clear. Those of us who can depend on family, it's huge, it's enormous. It makes an immense difference. If our families can be beside us, we're gonna do fine or we're going to do much, much better. If our families don't support us, the opposite is true. I don't mind using the word trans, but I rather use she, like, girl, instead, because that represents me more She was drawn to girl things, you know, like she wanted to have a doll at some point, and she was really upset about having to wear grey pants. And then she said, why can't I have that skirt? And we said, well, you know, Ollie, you know, you're a boy, you can't wear a skirt to go to school. I knew that I wanted to look like my dad, but not my mom. Not that my mom's ugly, I think my mom's really pretty, but I wouldn't want to look like that personally because it's not who I am. We kind of knew as early as two. The expression of self, like the questions like, I'm a boy or, or I, when do I get to be a boy? When is it my turn to be a boy? He should never play with skulls. I absolutely didn't trust that a child could know who they are. I would say, you're a girl. Like, this is who you are. I would even 
sometimes disapprove of what he chose to wear. And I would say, are you sure you're gonna wear that? Checking it out. I haven't been so lucky though. <laughs> Parents were skeptical because kids say things and they change their mind. And what I say to parents is, yes, kids change their mind about what instrument they want to play. Kids change their mind about who their friends are. Kids change their mind about what sports they want to do. But when it comes to gender, it's not the same. I had a child who was very angry, very closed up. And it was when Matt was like two and a half that they declared to me that Mom, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl, and I'm like, oh, okay. And it wasn't like, well, I feel like this, or I feel like that. It was really, this is who I am. As soon as the pronouns started changing, everyone kind of forgot that Matteo was anything but this cute little girl that everyone loved. And from there, Matt transitioned socially at the age of three to female, and by the age of five had the new legal name changed. My mother was always more accepting, and even from the start when I say I wanted to be a girl, like around two, she was always there to back me up and made sure that I lived the life of like almost a typical normal little girl. Around eight, kids start to notice things and they're like, oh, well, I knew you in kindergarten, you were different, and what gender are you? Are you a girl or a boy? There was a lot of bullying and it was really overwhelming for me. They ended up asking me to like pull down my pants or my skirt or my underwear and even show them. And then at one point I even decided to like send a picture and I was just in my underwear to show like proof because I like had given up. I didn't know what to do anymore. We tried different ways of integrating Matt in a school, and the problem we had was not with the students, but with the other teachers and the adults in the school environment who were very judgmental and very prejudiced against that. We've made a lot of progress in the last five years, and we've got a long way to go. The level of bullying, the level of harassment, and not just from students, but also from teachers, it's, it's still very bad. This is a really good foundation for you. Now and now I'm still feminine, but uh, I've taken on a more androgynous role in my life. It's a lot easier for me and uh, simpler for everyone around me to just be more androgynous or go by he at school. Because a lot of people aren't educated on the situation. What I would like to see is people relax a little bit about gender and realize that there's no harm in this. Nothing bad will happen. If somebody's gender doesn't necessarily meet your expectations, so what? You know, it's not going to cause you any harm. They're not going to hurt you. They're not going to hurt your family. They're just living their lives. It's ignorance when people don't want to protect a child or to include a child in their communities because they are scared. Our job is to protect our kids, to make sure that they grow as happy children, children that feel good within themselves. So when my child is saying that she feels like a girl, then, you know, I think it's good enough for me to say, well, you know, we'll support you to be who you are. Let's give it. Two. One hurt. Do I really want to see my kid attempt suicide? No. Just for... Uh, outside communities uh, to Not feel good. Key, yeah. <laughs> no, thanks no. very much. We feel good in the family itself. Ollie mm. feels great how she is now. Okay, let's roll no. with it. The biggest thing for any kid is resilience. You want to build a person who, that when they're old, they don't fall apart in the face of adversity. So we're trying as best we can to raise Ren with that resilience. Ren definitively wanted something to stop puberty. There were lots of conversations on, I do not want to have this body. And he had said to me, you know, I'm just starting to feel like I don't want to leave my room. I was really scared that my mom or dad will be like, no. Because of course you don't want to upset your parents, right? And if you feel like you're making them upset, then 
kind of get scared and you're like, oh, I don't want to tell them, but I need to tell them. If I feel like a boy, then I should be able to do everything that other boys do, and I should be able to go through puberty as a guy. He was very forceful in saying, when's it gonna happen? What's going on? Let's get on with this. And for good reason. He just, he felt the clock was ticking. Mm -hmm. So we, as his parents, felt the same thing. Ready? Go. Okay. <laughs> I've never met a transgender person who told me they're glad they waited to transition. I have had 10 year olds tell me they wish they'd transition when they were eight. I've never had a single person say, I'm glad I waited. We have these hormone blockers or puberty blockers, which can just stop puberty. So there's time for the kid to mature a bit and for the family to get used to the idea, knowing that you can completely revert it. Before I took blockers, I was worried about the beard mostly <laughs> and the voice. The beard and the voice and the pump that I'll hang here. I'm going to use blue because blue is the best. I'm glad that I'm not going through anything that's girly. When I'm 16, I'll start taking testosterone and then become a person with a beard. <laughs> we kind of have a little joke, like when we hear someone say, you know, oh, we're having a boy. And I kind of think, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Everybody who comes into a society brings their own individuality with them. Transgender people are, at this point, asking to have the rights and privileges that everybody else has. Do we need radical changes in society for that to happen? In the short term, no. But in the long term, I think that giving transgender people the space to live true to who they really feel themselves to be will transform society. I feel more and more today that there are a lot more trans people who are successful, and that gives me a lot of hope. I feel like I belong to this network, and that we're fighting really hard to improve the lives of trans people, so that younger, the younger generation doesn't have to go through what many of us have had to go through. Once I decided to stop engaging in sex work, a friend of mine had been working at a salon, and. I had expressed to a few people that I knew that had jobs that I wanted to start working legit. And he was the only person that really took me seriously. And he got me an interview and I got the job. So for the first time ever, I had an actual nine to five job and bills to pay. So life changed for me a lot. I feel very happy that I've transitioned into the person that I am today. I sleep better at night. Not have to worry about getting arrested because <laughs> I'm not doing anything illegal anymore. Currently, I'm waiting for my legal name change and my legal gender change to be sent to me. So that's like a new birth certificate and a health card. Being able to have legal verification that, yes, I am a woman, it's going to help with everything. Because legally, physically, and mentally, you're a woman. The wait is terrible. I've been sitting here like twiddling my thumbs. I just want to have it in my hands and be like, I'm a person, I'm a person. <laughs> it's LGBT. I think that T right now, it's, it's always been disregarded. Me and my community are definitely going to put that spotlight and that T as much as we can because the transgender identity would free up people to understand full equality of gender. Every five years, the number of people who identify as trans has doubled. So here's how many trans people there are. More than yesterday, less than tomorrow. Watch out, here we come. It's wonderful to be trans and to be able to have accessed the technologies that mean I can live in this body with so much more pleasure, with so much more presence, that I can live as myself with so much more authenticity. I haven't made it my business to tell people at work that I'm trans. I don't think it's important. I think it's irrelevant. If someone were to ask me, I wouldn't deny it. I'm not ashamed of who I am. I just don't think it matters.
there are trans people who say this whole idea that there are men and there are women and you're one or the other it doesn't work. The dividing line between the sexes is something that is a matter of public debate because we make different social decisions. We need to see diversity in gender, and we need to give up on this idea that there's only two genders, even give up on the idea that there's only two sexes. And maybe the time for dividing up everybody in society on the basis of what their genitals look like is past.